We have an X flare and a one two punch. Those stories and more in the news this week. If you want to learn how weather from our star causes impacts at the Earth that shape the future of our world, join professors Dr. Jenny Meehan, Michael Cook, and myself as we guide you through a space weather certificate program like no other. To enroll in the space weather and environment science program offered at Millersville University, go to millersville.com. Edu slash Swen. It's weather for the 21st century. This forecast also sponsored in part by CW Ops. Our sun has gotten quite busy this week. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, we are saying goodbye to region 3354, but not before it fires a big X-class flare. Bam! Right there on the second. Now you'd think that it would launch a big solar storm along with that, but no, it actually didn't. However, this region is continuing to stay flare active and we're going to be dealing with noise on the amateur radio bands here on the day side for the next day or so before this region completely disappears behind the sun's west limb. Now the new activity is pretty much all located in the south. We have regions 3357, 58, and 59, and they're really kind of tied up in a very complex uh, configuration along with a couple of filaments and as you've been watching that region those that area you've seen a few filament launches there was one on the second and then we got a launch of another filament up in the north that uh, is a solar storm that is going to be going northeast of Earth. But then on the 4th, we get kind of this weird kind of reconfiguration just above that southern coronal hole, and it just lets go. It's kind of hard to see on the disk, but when we take a look at it in coronagraphs, whoosh, you can see that big ha partial halo in the south. That is an Earth-directed solar storm, and along with the one that launched northeast of us, it sure looks like we're going to get some decent activity starting maybe late on the 6th and into the 7th. We're already seeing a little bit of the mini solar storms from some of the filament launches that happened earlier. So we could get some decent aurora over the 6th and the 7th, possibly the 8th, and then we're going to get a bit of fast solar wind to boot. So we could have some activity, especially at uh, high latitudes, until about the 9th before things really settle down. So this is good news for aurora photographers who's been waiting for so long for some decent activity. Now switching to our far-sided monitor, this is Stereo A, and it's looking at the sun just a smidge from the side. As you take a look in Stereo's view, you can see that big coronal hole in the south. That was the one that I was talking about. That should orient you. And you can also see that kind of finger-like coronal hole, kind of in center disk. Well, that is going to be rotating into the Earth's strike zone in and around the 8th or so, and that's the, going to be the fast solar wind that's going to chase the one-two punch that we're getting that could extend that storming for a little while. But as we take a look at the east Slim in Stereo's view, look down in the south. Do you see that bright region? Now, one of those, there's actually several regions here, and one of those regions is region 3363 that's just beginning to rotate into Earth view, but another one, and there's one behind that. We have to look to at the JSOC helioseismology far-sighted viewer, and we take a look at that, you can actually see those dark regions. Those are old active regions that are surviving their far-sighted passage, and they're strong. So these regions are going to be rotating into Earth Earth view here in the next couple days. Plus, we have this coronal hole that you can also see kind of in the north. That's going to be giving us uh, some fast solar wind here in about probably uh, two weeks or so. So you definitely can see that we're going to have some big activity coming up very soon, including big flare players and perhaps some more chances for solar storming. Now, switching to our solar storm prediction model, Enlil, this is NASA's version of the model. You're looking down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right. And as we take a look at the two solar storms being launched, you can see the first one being launched definitely to the east of Earth. That's the slower one. And the second one, which is much faster, is much more of a direct hit. Now, because the first one is actually going to the north of Earth and the second one is going to the south of Earth, there's not going to be all that much interaction. But we should get an impact early 
to midday on the 7th of July, and that interaction may actually cause the, it, the storming to extend. In fact, we're going to get a little bit of some fast solar wind after these two storms hit that could extend the storming even further. Taking a look at the NOAA's version of Enlil, in this case, the top panel's density, the bottom panel's velocity. Again, you're looking down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right again. This time when you see the storms being launched, they're already kind of interacting a bit more and they kind of come out as one big mess of things. And they the impact time, however, is still about 7 UT on the 7th, so the two models definitely agree. And you can even see there's a little bit of a precursor, which is what we're feeling right now. That's the the some of that the precursor of that fast solar wind that we're going to experience. So Already we're getting a little bit of disturbed conditions, but on the 7th through the 8th, we should get some decent aurora, possibly down to mid latitudes, and then things will go into fast solar wind, which could extend it stormy, especially at high latitudes. So aurora photographers, here's a nice long window to get some decent aurora, and it's been about time. Switching to our moon, we are now coming out of the full moon phase on our way to a third quarter, and by the 10th, the moon will still be about 45% illuminated. So you night sky watchers, if you want to catch those dim objects in the sky and, I don't know, maybe some aurora, well, you're going to have this bright companion, so you're going to need to check your local rise and set times. Switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are anticipating the impact from that one-two punch of those two solar storms, followed by some fast solar wind. So at high latitudes, NOAA is expecting minor storm conditions, but we have up to about a 35% chance of a major storm, and this is going to peak right about midday on the 7th, and then continue storming, possibly decent storming, through the 8th, and then into the 9th, we're going to start getting some fast solar wind, and that's when things are really going to start calming down. So aurora photographers at high latitudes, boy, you're going to get a decent chance for aurora. You might even be experiencing some right now because conditions are already beginning to ramp up ahead of these storms. Now, at mid-latitudes, the story's not quite so great, but not too bad. We're only expecting active conditions, but we do have up to about a 25% chance of a minor storm. Again, the peak is going to be on the 7th, but you could get continued shows, sporadic shows through the 8th, and possibly a little bit in the 9th as things begin to calm down. But likely the 7th is going to be really when you're going to need to time it if you're going to go out and chase. Switching to our solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week, we are saying goodbye to region 3354 as it rotates to the sun's far side, and this is having an effect on the solar flux. We are kind of tuning down just a little bit. In fact, we're now sitting about the mid-150s, and that may go down even further, maybe to about 145 or so before things begin to ramp back up with the new regions that are going to rotate into view over the next couple days. But the nice thing is that we are now down to minor noise levels on the radio bands. We don't have nearly the intense radio uh, uh, blackouts that we've been having over the past week thanks to that region being gone. NOAA's giving us only about a 20% chance of an R1 to R2 level radio blackout. That's an M-class flare over the next couple days. Now we might see that risk ramp up just a little bit and go back into the moderate noise range. It all depends upon what these new regions are going to do when they rotate into view. But we are sitting about an, a 5% chance of X-class flares. That's an R3 level radio blackout. And that's likely going to continue again for the next couple days. But you might see near the end of the week, things begin to pick up when it comes to risk. But for the moment, we can take a breather. Switching to our radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week, Thankfully, everything is in the green this week due to region 3354 rotating to the sun's far side. We are sitting at the D1 normal range for you aviators, which is also known as the S0 all quiet range. In fact, NOAA is only giving us about a 1% chance of an S1 to S2 radiation storm over the next three days or so. And likely that trend is going to continue throughout the entire week. So you frequent flyers and you pilots and you air crew and you high risk passengers breathe a sigh of relief and enjoy your week because it looks like you're getting a nice reprieve. So the space weather this week has gotten very busy. Now we are saying goodbye to region 3354, and although it has been a big solar flare producer and has given us a lot of noise on the amateur radio bands, it really hasn't been much of a solar storm producer, at least not any solar storms directed towards Earth. However, we do have a couple solar storms that were launched from other regions that are Earth directed and some mini solar storms to boot. In fact, we're already seeing a little bit of activity, but the activity could peak easily 
usually like around late on the 6th, into the 7th, and possibly into the 8th before things begin to calm down, thanks to some fast solar wind that will be a chaser. So Aurora photographers, even if you're at mid-latitudes, you could definitely get a bit of a show with this one. Maybe a bit sporadic here and there, but you could definitely get m multiple chances over this, you know, nice long extended window. Now, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, well, you know, things are looking up for you because that big region is finally rotating to the sun's far side. We have maybe another day or so before things on the band should calm down just a little bit. Now, we do have a new uh, region and another maybe two regions that are going to be rotating into Earth view over the next week that could also be big flare players. But for a few days, you might get a little bit of a respite. So enjoy that time off. And now uh, GPS users, well, you know, we've got this solar storms, a set of solar storms that are going to be impacting us over a, a set of days here. And that could make a GPS reception on Earth's night side, especially anywhere near Aurora, pretty dicey. But thankfully, that noise on the bands and the big radio blackouts are kind of diminishing for the moment. So day side and near dawn and dusk might be a little bit better for you. But overall, things could be a little bit tough this week for GPS reception. So be sure to stay on your toes. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching.